Hello, dear friends, and welcome to our weekly program on Cardiac Radio, where we nourish our souls 24-7. What an amazing blessing this is. And today we will continue our beautiful study of this most profound book by Alan Kardec, by the name of Genesis. We will continue our study with chapter 17, which is in the latter part of the book. And we are finding ourselves in the chapter that's entitled Predictions in the Gospel. And there we will be studying today the subchapter entitled The Second Coming of Christ, which of course is intimately linked to last week's study, which was the announcement of the consoler. And um, as we remember, that was primarily in John and the consoler was clearly not um, Jesus Christ again. And it was the consoler was not to come in flesh and blood, but in spirit form. So let us see what we learn in addition to last week as well. So we're studying items 43 through 46 today, and then we will be touching on another subject. So dear friends, welcome. Um, feel, please feel embraced and welcomed, um, and let us begin. So, the second coming of Christ. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For he who wants to save his life shall lose it and he who loses his life out of love for me shall find it again so there is a prediction right then he continues and, and this is in matthew matthew 16 verses 24 through 28 what good does it do a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul or what can a man exchange to redeem his soul after he has lost it? For the Son of Man must come with his angel in the glory of his Father, and will give to each according to his deeds. So there's another prediction that Jesus is making through Matthew, and obviously he's alluding to the law of cause and effect. Then he continues. Verily, verily, I say to you, there are some of those who are here today who will not suffer death without having seen the man of, Son of Man come in his kingdom. So this is another prediction. So we will not, um, we're here today who will not suffer death without having seen the Son of Man come in his kingdom so this is really important we'll, we'll talk about that because that's a little bit harder to understand item 44 this is in mark 14 verses 60 through 63 then after being led into the midst of the assembly the high priest questioned jesus and said to him do you not respond to me regarding what has been said against you but Jesus remained silent and did not respond. The high priest questioned him further and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the ever-blessed God? Jesus responded to him, I am he. And someday you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God's majesty and coming upon the clouds of heaven. Immediately, the high priest tore his garments and said, what further testimony do we need? Yes, misunderstandings, right? So now let us see how Alan Kardec explains these sections and helping us with that. So he says in item 45, Jesus announced his second coming. But he did not say that he would return to earth in a corporeal body or 
that the consoler would be personified in him. In other words, that the consoler would be him, that he would come back. He represented himself as having to come in spirit, in the glory of his father. In other words, in the glory of his father to judge merit and demerit and to render to all according to their deeds when the times were fulfilled. Remember, he said in Matthew um, verse 24 through 28, for the son of man must come with his angels in the glory of his father and will give to each according to his deeds. So here he represents, Jesus represents himself as having to come in spirit in the glory of his father to judge merit and demerit and to render to all according to their deeds when the times were fulfilled. Law of cause and effect. So let us remember last week, because Jesus is really here saying the same thing through Matthew, which he said in John. Last week through John, we learned that he said, I will ask my father and he will send you another consoler. Jesus clearly indicates there was that this consoler would not be Jesus himself. So the same thing, same information. We like that when they overlap, right? Otherwise, he would have said, I will return to complete what I have taught you. And he clearly didn't, right? So that's more proof. And then he adds, Jesus adds, quote, so that it may remain with you forever and be within you. He's talking about the teachings, that they will remain with us forever and be within us. This statement, Alan Craddock said last week, could not refer to an incarnate individuality because an incarnate individuality could not remain for us forever. We know that, right? Much less be within us. So the consoler is therefore, according to Jesus' thought, the personification of a supremely consoling what? What is the consoler, according to Jesus and Alan Kardec's interpretation? The co consoler is therefore, according to Jesus, Jesus' thought, the personification of a, I know you know it, but now we're going to say it, a supremely consoling doctrine whose inspirer would be the spirit of truth, right? So the spirit of truth is the umbrella, is the overlooker, is, is the one in charge for all the spirit messages that come through, forming the doctrine that Alan Carter codified. And that is the um, consoler that Jesus promises promised us. So, as we can see, these two chapters are intimately connected. So this verbal promise, so let's continue. Let me see there whether there's any comments because I'm actually, Nora is here. Hi, dear Nora. Andrea is here. Tony, Teresa, Mark, thank you so much, friends. What I'm going to do also is I'm going to um, get the PowerPoint. Let me get that. Because then we have the visuals also. Here we go. All right. And we're going to go. Okay. All right. Second coming of Christ. So Jesus announced the second coming, but did not say he would be the one to return to earth. We just said that in a corporeal body, the consoler would be personified in him. No, the consoler is the consoling doctrine. Oh, overlooked by the spirit of truth and all the different spirit messages that have come through. So he represented himself to come in spirit in the glory of his father to judge merit and demerit. So now let us go on to... Another sentence, there are some of those who are here today, Jesus said, who shall not suffer death without having seen the Son of Man come in his kingdom. So what could he have meant by that? And Alan Kardec is saying, could that be a contradiction? Does that really make sense what he says there? Now let us look at that. 
So it seems like a contradiction since it is obvious that he did not come during the lifetime of any of those who were present at the time. Right? We know that there are some of those who are here today who shall not suffer death without having seen the Son of Man come in his kingdom. So the promised consoler, there are some who were there when Jesus spoke that, that would not die before they would be seeing the consoler. Now, how can that be, right? So that is the um, contradiction, the potential contradiction that Alan Kardec is now airing out, explaining to us. However, and it doesn't make sense because obviously the promised consoler didn't come during those present days yet. However, Jesus could not have been mistaken. And we know that he is our guide and model. He is the governor of this planet. How can he err? Mm -mm. No, not possible. So we know that much. So Jesus could not have been mistaken about a prediction of that nature. And especially regarding a contemporary issue that concerned him personally. So it doesn't make sense. One must ask first whether his words were always transmitted faithfully. And that is really a good question. So Alan Craddock, first of all, so one thing is clear, Jesus didn't make a mistake. So he said the truth. So it must mean something else. So now he goes down the list of options of how, um, what could be the reason for why he said that. So, so number one, we've ruled out. He didn't make a mistake. Number two, his words were not transmitted faithfully. Well, that's entirely possible because they're all recorded. And so well, let's continue here, which could be doubted if we remember that he wrote nothing down, right? Jesus was not the one who had paper, pen, and pencil, or papyrus, papyrus, or whatever it's called, the material where they were writing on at the time, if they even had it. I don't even know. So in other words, he didn't write anything down. So it didn't come straight from his mind and mouth. It was written down by the apostles. We hear it through John, and we hear it through Matthew and Mark. And we also know that his words were collected only after his death. They were collected after his death. So Jesus is already gone and now somebody is gonna go in their memory. Three guys are going into their memories and writing things down. Now we know how our memories either embellish things, tweak things, you know, nothing is 100% out of our memory. So we have to really take that into consideration. So that's number one. Then we need to consider seeing that the same discourse was nearly always reproduced by each evangelist in different terms. They used different terms. I mean, in this case, it's overlapping, but it's different words. It's, it's from a different angle, right? And so it's different. Furthermore, Ellen Quiet says, the meaning sometimes must have been altered as they passed through successive what? Translations. Also, they didn't speak English. It was a completely different language. This was over 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. And I mean, we can barely um, get something right that happened yesterday recorded correctly, right? I mean, we know how our minds play tricks and everything. So we need to we need to take that into consideration. And thanks to Alan Kardec, he puts the focal point on that. He puts the flashlight on that particular item. And that is not just for this particular sentence. That is something that goes, that weaves across everything in life, really. Now he says, on the other hand, it is certain that if Jesus had said everything that he could have said, if he had said everything he could have said, he would have expressed himself more clearly and precisely about everything without leaving any room for mistake as he did regarding his moral principles. Whereas 
he had to veil his thought regarding subjects that he did not deem appropriate to delve into. So here's a whole other scenario reason why this might sound like a um, contradiction, but we know it's not because we'll find the explanation in a minute. And that is that Jesus was only a thousand percent clear when it came to the moral teachings, interestingly enough. Why do we think he did that? Because unmistakably, we needed those the most and we were ready to work on that. And we have for the past before even maybe, but definitely since, you know, for the past 2000 some years. And we know that we have a long way to go. But he, we know that he was crystal clear when it came to the moral teachings. Let's look at the Beatitudes. There is no doubt what he meant. Right? So anyway. So he's saying that he did not express himself clearly in all the subjects. And why did he not do that? Except for the moral teachings, which were super clear. Because the people of his time weren't ready to hear that. They would have just freaked out. I mean, we know in our today's times how many of us are not willing or ready to hear certain things that some others of us are completely understanding, right? So that is a common phenomenon. It's something that's not new, that existed back then too. Now he needed to be... Um, I want to say like choosing his battles, right? To blow them out of the water with what he was really trying to, to express here would have been counterproductive. And Jesus as the master, he knew when to be clear and when to be allegorical or a little nebulous. So in this case, he was. It was not a moral teaching. At any rate, Alan Kardec says, the fact is that things did not happen as they thought they would. They predicted, they, they understood that in the moment before they would die, they would see the promised consoler. Didn't happen. So there's another piece of information for us that that could not have been the meaning that Jesus was giving us. All right, so then what was it, right? So we can see here in this slide, I hope you guys can see it, so is there a contradiction when he said there are some of those who are here today who shall not suffer death without having seen the Son of Man come in his kingdom? So he did not come, the consoler did not come during the lifetime of any of those who were present at the time. Check. We know that. Is it a faithful transmission of his words? We don't know. Most likely not 100%. His words were collected only after his death. That supports the maxim that it was probably is probably not 100%. The same discourse is reproduced in different terms by the evangelists. Another sign that it's not 100% what we're reading. Successive translations might have altered some meanings. We know that even in present day translations we're getting from the Portuguese, right? And then there's the apostles who wrote down Jesus' thought according to their own idea. And the thought was perhaps more in more absolute manner the way they saw it than from the point of view, and they saw it from the point of view of the present. Slide is a little bit mangled down there, I'm just noticing, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but essentially what, what Alan Kodak has helped us to, to understand is the, the, the disciples, the apostles wrote things down, they of course put their interpretation into it. And they were, a developmental state that the present time was all there was. So, this kind of proves to us that this text, th these interpretation, this is not the road to embark on because we know that um, all of this we know now. So this must be something else. Now let's see, what is it? And you can probably guess already, but maybe you can't, but maybe you can. So let's see, item 46. A crucial point that Jesus was not able to develop because the people of his time were not sufficiently prepared for ideas of that order or their consequences, 
but for which he set forth the principles, he set the foundation, just as he did for all matters that weren't clear, was the great and important what? Law of reincarnation. He did not, he was not crystal clear about that at all. He just alluded to it. But hindsight is 2020. We now knowing that the law of reincarnation exists, it's factual. Now we can go back and now we see how he was so intelligently weaving it in, but not saying it per se. That's, that's the master. So let us read the sentence again because it has many pieces. So let us say again. So a crucial point that Jesus was not able to develop because the people of his time were not sufficiently prepared. Right? People weren't ready to hear the law of reincarnation, about the law of re reincarnation. And uh, for that, which he said, but he said the principle, he built the foundation for it, like in many other teachings was the great and important law of reincarnation. So the law of reincarnation was not fully explained and developed during his times for all who listened, including his disciples. It is by means, oh wait, we're, we're skipping. This law studied and brought to light in our days by spiritism is the key to many passages in the gospel, which without it seem nonsensical. Now it makes sense. So now let us go back for a moment. So the law of reincarnation did get, not get fully developed due to the limitations of the people of his time. And the law of reincarnation, however, is the key to understanding, the understanding of many gospel passages. So what we can do, <laughs> Every time something isn't clear, maybe we can plug that in. Law of reincarnation it makes sense. It probably won't fit everywhere, but that's that's our little hint here, as they call it, a hack. <laughs> the gospel hack. So let us go back to the sentence. There are some of those who are here today who shall not suffer death without having seen the Son of Man come in his kingdom. Now let us plug the law of reincarnation into it and all of a sudden it makes some sense. Okay, let us let us move on before we, we, we speak about it. Let's go on and first see what Alan Craddock helps us to understand. It is by means of this law that one can find a rational explanation for the above cited words. There are some of those who are here today who shall not suffer death without having seen the Son of Man come in his kingdom. See, there is this like in the moment, who are here today. That's what they heard him say. Is it really, right? We don't know. Who shall not suffer death, who won't die before they see the promised consoler. If one accepts them as textual, um, if one accept that. Okay, it is by means of this law that one can find a rational explanation for the above cited words if one accepts them as textual. So if we if we for a moment run on the assumption that this is these are the correct words, right? Because that's all we have. So we have to base the further uh, rational explanations on what we've got. Since they cannot be applied to the apostles personally. It is obvious that they refer to the future reign of Christ, namely the promised consoler, that is, to the time in which his doctrine would be better understood and would become universal law. By telling them that some of those who are present would witness his coming, this can be understood. Ah, oh, we're sighing a sigh of relief because now finally we get it. We can only in this understand it in the sense that they would live again at that time. So everyone who was there or those who listened to him, maybe just the disciples, they would be reincarnated today or 150, 160 years ago when spiritism was codified by Alan Kardec. Now it makes more sense. There are some of those who are here today who shall not suffer death without having seen the Son of Man 
They will be coming back. Now, I hear you say, well, it doesn't really sense, but it's, it's said like suffer death without dying, right? So, but let's keep in mind that maybe the words are not 100% correct in this. The presentation by John, Mark, and Matthew, you know, they all said a little bit differently, but we clearly know that spiritism is the promised consoler. So, Alan Kardec is correct from our estimation that the most rational explanation is the law of reincarnation because we will be experiencing it. We are now, we were probably alive back then where we with Christ, we don't know, but here we are. Thank God, here we are now, right, finally. The Jews, however, believed that they were going to witness everything that Jesus announced. They took his allegories literally. They're, some of them are still waiting for the Messiah to come in blood and flesh. So that's not correct. Moreover, some of his predictions did come true during that time, such as the destruction of Jerusalem happened, the misfortunes that would result from it, and the dispersion of the Jews it all happened. However, Jesus took his vision further, farther, and speaking in the present, he constantly made allusions to the future. And then we need to also not forget again, as we said earlier, the apostles would had different consciousness than we do today. They were much more present. It was all now, right now much more limited, whereas Jesus, of course, uh, remember, he's the master, right? I mean, it's hard to even put words to, we can't even quite understand how evolved and elevated he is because we're not there. But when we remember, when we looked at the theory of, for, theory of foreknowledge um, a few weeks ago here in Genesis, um, the analogy that Alan Kardec gave us was this, this person on top of the mountain who looks down into the valley and sees exactly what the traveler who is just starting on his journey down in the valley, far down in the valley, isn't able to see. But the traveler up high on the mountain can exactly see what this traveler will be experiencing and possibly even approximately when was this free will which changes it. So this traveler, um, this man or woman on the mountain is a high level spirit, that's more like Jesus. So it sounded like in the moment because it was also in the moment for him because everything for this person on top of the mountain is already happened, has already happened. There's two different ways of, that's the quantum field from what I understand. We have different timelines we our timeline is linear and because we can't look beyond the next thorn bush <laughs> or maybe rose bush something positive but the spirits on high somebody like Jesus sees it whatever happens 2,000 years from now and it's like already happened that's the quantum field anyway I hope I make sense um, so there are some of those who are here today. So the rational explanation is based on the law of reincarnation. And some of those who are here today, they would live again. And Jesus took his vision much farther than the present moment. He constantly made allusions to the future, the future, our future. All right, friends, so let us get out of here. Let me connect with you. Here we are. Any questions, any comments? Um, Luciana, hi from Florianopolis. Wow, welcome, Luciano. It's so nice to have you long distance. And Helder, thank you so much for joining. So I'm guessing it's all clear. And if that's the case, we will now spend a few moments on, a, um, on item 33 and 34 of chapter 17 that we have not discussed yet. And that is the coming of Elijah. So here we go. And our, if you want to follow along in this version, it's page 395. However, it's 
chapter 17 for anyone who has a different version chapter 17 item 33 the coming of elijah it's kind of linked to the same subject so here it is and this is in matthew then his disciples asked him why do the scribes say that elijah must come first Jesus answered, it is true that Elijah must come and that he will reestablish all things. But I declare to you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but, re but treated him as they pleased. In the same way, they will put the Son of Man to death. So he made another prediction. That was his own crucifixion. And then he says, you guys are not recognizing Elijah did come already. And he was not treated with kindness either. Then his disciples understood that he had spoken to them of whom? John the Baptist. So we already know that the general subject matter of this is the law of reincarnation again, right? So here we go. Here's Alan Kardec's explanation. Elijah had already returned in the person of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was the reincarnation of Elijah. His coming again is announced explicitly. Thus, since he could not return except in a new body, it is the formal consecration of the principle of the plurality of existences. Boom, there it is. So as we just discussed this other item in the gospel that is alluding to reincarnation, to the law of reincarnation, only makes sense knowing that the law of re reincarnation is a law. In this particular section, Jesus actually cements it in. That's where it is established. So this is really wonderful, isn't it? So here, we will say it again. It is the formal consecration of the principle of the plurality of existences, which is the law of reincarnation, of course. Now, let us for a moment jump over to the gospel. Because in the gospel, chapter 4, number, number item 10, chapter 4, item 10, chapter 4, item 10. Oh, I already earmarked it. It's also discussed. Um, and here we learn if the principle of reincarnation as expressed in John could be strictly interpreted in a purely mystical sense, the same could not apply to this passage from Matthew, which is unmistakable. He himself is Elijah who must come. He, and he wrote it in, in capital letters in here. <laughs> so Alan Kardec is published in capital letters. So he himself is is elijah who must come so it's clear how else could it be himself other than the spirit coming back unmistakable and here there is neither a symbol nor allegory it's not an allegory it is a positive uh, affirmation so for all those who are questioning still the law of reincarnation this may be a good passage to bring up if we are inclined to do so. So then he continues, since the time of John the Baptist, is a quote, since the time of John the Baptist until the present, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by violence. What do these words mean since John the Baptist was still alive at the time? Jesus explains, if you want to understand what I have told you, he himself is Elijah who must come. Remember the section we just read? Hence, in John, since John was none other than Elijah himself, Jesus was alluding to the time when John was living under the name of Elijah. So there is no doubt that John and Elijah are the same people, different lifetimes same souls law of reincarnation is alive is a law unmistakably because again he says what capital letters he himself is elijah who must come 
All right, dear friends, I think that's it. Let's see, that, that's the item, yes. So, thank you so much for joining. It's been an amazing pleasure to get more clarity about all the different um, sections of the predictions and uh, getting to know the, the gospel sections better from that angle. So thank you so much, dear God, and thank you so much, Jesus, for all you've done. We will still work on understanding you better and definitely practicing your teachings better. And also thank you, Alan Kardec, for your immense, incredible work that the deeper we dive, the more we appreciate. So much gratitude. And of course, thank you to, to Kardec Radio, the mentors on both sides in both realms, that we have this lovely opportunity to gather 24 seven, nourishing our souls. Dear friends, so God willing, we will be back next week and we will be studying um, Let's just quickly see what's next. The precursory signs. That's going to be very interesting. It'll be the portrayal of the end of time. Wow. Good night, dear friends. Many blessings. <laughs>